Uh, this is a, some of y'all might have already seen this one before. It's a rescue of a construction worker by the Houston Fire Department a few years back. And the most entertaining part is the commentary by the people witness it or videoing it. Jesus, oh my God. Is that a construction guy? Yeah. He was inside there. Do they freaking see him? Unbelievable. Oh my God. Hurry up. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Oh my God. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh. Oh my God. Keep going. Keep going. Oh. The glass melting up there. The they need to get him. Oh, Jesus. <gasps> oh, God. Oh, God. Hell, he can jump from there. I mean, good grief. I be jumping, man. They need to move that truck up. Oh, my God. I don't know why they're not evacuating this. I think that we probably should be going. Jump for it, man. Hell yes. Oh, oh, thank Jesus. Thank you, God. I'm trying to figure out if you lost the blood of radio or something. Oh, my God. <laughs> They got him. Three oh, okay. She's like, what about the construction? Oh, Jesus. Oh, do you see a scene? I think it's time for us to go. All right. Um, just looking at that video, it looked like it went pretty, uh, pretty smooth. Some I heard somebody say. Um, Heard somebody say that uh, it's telling the other person to get down. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and that's what I thought. I didn't. I couldn't tell if this, you saw a second person on that aerial device, and I couldn't tell if the person up there was telling the other one to get down or telling the oper operator to move it. Um, but it looked like it was telling them to get down because, like I said, I don't know what the age of that apparatus was. It had a pre-piped waterway on it, but it may only have a 200. 50 pound tip load. So you got a firefighter at the tip of it that's probably fully geared with that probably weighs, you know, could be close to 250, 300 pounds with all this, the gear on. And then you got a construction worker about ready to get on that uh, device. So you're already, you're getting close to that tip load right there. Um, so I think that's why I was telling the other person to stay down. Um, talking about tip loads. Most of our ladders now, the quince, truck one, truck three, they're all 500 pound tip loads. Now, are they tested higher than that? Probably so, but that's what the, they recommend as far as manufacturers recommend for a tip load, but they're probably tested higher than that. Like everything else, we always test it higher than what the rated capacity is with ropes, anything. Um, what's a what's good thing you saw with the operator? A um, couple things that the operator did. Wasn't jerky, but what else? Really yep, right before, as soon as, instead of trying to retract right there to bring them down or let them climb down, they were, the operator retracted away from the building because, I don't know, maybe they saw something that the other people didn't see, the possible collapse, but just wanted to get the device out of the way of uh, harm's way. Uh, what's another thing you saw? He was watching the guy on the ladder because he was listening to him. Yeah, communicating. Um, also, what do you do when you're, you do have a rescue? Do you put that ladder right directly to the person? Did you see how panicky that guy was? He jumped down one, uh, one level. So how did he bring that aerial device in? Lowered it to the person. Shot above the person and lowered it to him instead of shooting it straight up to him. You just never know. Person's, you know, all that heat's on that person, they're going to jump if it's getting to that point. So 
So they did. A, it looks like they did a you know perfect operation there to get that person down. All right, talks about communications. This is just going to talk about like uh, effective communication allows for early and correct aerial placement, positioning, stuff like that. So it talks about pre-arrival, once you're on the scene, and tactical. Um, I'll go a little step further with that. Um, before any of this, before the incident ever comes in, what's, what's the biggest thing about taking from your district? What can you learn from your district, the district you're assigned to, especially if you're driving? What are you looking at? What's some of the things you're looking at? Hydrants, Hydrants water supply, um, power lines, which side they're going to be on, uh, alleys, do you got access or not to them? Um, what else? Building construction, what types of construction you got in your uh, district? Um, that's all going to play a huge role in being successful, especially, especially if something comes in at 3 o'clock in the morning and you know your district pretty well, you're, not getting, you're already going to be one step ahead um, if you know your district. Especially, like I said, you comes in at 3 o'clock in the morning, you wake up from a dead sleep, you're going to know where you're going, you're going to know what you're riding up on. Um, I'm not saying you need to know the whole city, but especially areas of your first alarm, you should know that. Um, you can depend on an iPad, but I'm telling you right now, iPad will direct you to the wrong location sometimes. I've seen it happen. So, so all done? Yes, you're good to go. Is it going to work? Absolutely. I did. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the thing. iPads, they're great. I think, I think that's the best one of the best new technology things we got. But I've seen them put you, some of them iPads, they put you behind, like put you on a street behind the actual address. So you got to be careful with those. The best thing to do is learn your district. Get out, ride your district. Um, a lot of the captains are proactive. They get out and like to ride their districts, see what they got in their district, see what type of new construction they got, old construction, see what access they can get to the streets and all that. Um, that's the way you're going to learn your district. Um, you're going to be familiar with it. Um, get out and actually ride your district. Um, learn the maps. You, so when you wake up or any time a run comes in, you can think, I know where it's at. You know, so you don't have to think about it. Like I always said, getting to the fire scenes half the battle. Once you get to the fire scene, everything else falls into place. Training and all that takes over. Uh, just a few things about communication again on an incident. Like I said, you can look through that. Um, On-scene communication includes uh, specific information about size up and placement. Officer usually an operator will do a size up, confirm water supply strategy if they need it, um, apparatus, location, turntable placement, all that stuff's going on when you're pulling up on the scene. And I, ongoing as the scene, as the incident uh, is unfolding. Talked about communication a little bit. All right. Uh, describe the use of aerial devices to access upper levels. What do we use? What do we use aerial devices for? What's some of the tasks that we use? Rescue, ventilation. What else? Yep. Elevated master streams, direct fire, defensive operations, direct direct fire uh, uh, attack, um, portable standpipes. Also, um, getting equipment, tools. Um, you know, that was one thing with uh, Center for the Arts, Kentucky. You know, we used aerial devices to get hose, tools, and everything in to place where we need it. So, it's several uses, and that's it goes over with this slide what they're used for. All right, kind of talks about uh, the use of an aerial device to rescue victims. And the one thing we already kind of talked about, you got to worry about weight limitations. Overloading the device could lead to sudden failure. So you always got to be thinking about that. Um, here's your best scenario. The best rescue approach is made from upwind, on a level grade, and without obstructions. Is that always going to happen? Probably 90% of the time that's not going to happen. So you're always going to have to adapt to what you got going on. Uh, talking about positioning again, 
at the corner of a building. It talks here that you can reach both sides of the building by parking at the uh, positioning at the corner. Also, it helps with structural collapse because like you had, your strongest point is going to be your corner. Building's going to fall out, you know, on the sides and stuff. So your strongest point is going to be your corner. Um, how far should you position away from the building? And why? Why are we doing that? Because buildings don't fall in, right? Most of the time they're going to fall out. All the debris is going to, it's going to be a path that it's going to create. Sometimes two times. Depending on the size of the building, you might even want to go, or amount of fire when you pull up on it, you might want to be about at least two times away from the building, just to be safe. Um, what's another thing about parking on the corner of the building? What else is a good thing? It helps. Especially if you got this, this whole building's on fire, what's another good thing? Yeah, but also radiant heat. Most of your heat's going to come on the sides of the building, so if you're on the corner, you're not going to catch as much heat. Also, another thing, if you got, say, uh, <coughs> you got some firefighters that you placed up here to do ventilation, um, say the ladder's position here, they get off, they uh, start cutting a hole, all of a sudden it gets real bad, they can't get back to this side, so you can move the ladder over to this side so they can make an exit on this side. So position at the corner has several advantages on a building. Um, instead of rescue to be made from an area threatened by fire, hose lines can be used to protect victims, rescuers, and area. So, all right. Talks about here in um, um, positioning in, in the perpendicular position, twisting stresses imposed on aerial are reduced. So the way you're positioned, the best position for raising an aerial is, is one in which the extended and rotated device is perpendicular to the objective. All right, it's going to talk about here, unsupported tips. Why do we not place our ladders on window sills or roof lines to support them? Where's the stress really, where's the stress would occur mostly when you're doing it? Where's that? Where's the stress occur? Yep, in the middle. You're putting undue stress. Now the older ladders... Older, heavier ladders, you could do that. You could put, because of the material they're made of, stronger material, they were designed to be placed, supported on a window or on a roof line. But these not, they're not. They're supposed to, as you're, you're walking up them, fall into the building. That way you put undue stress on them. Talks about if you had to extend the ladder at an angle, um, the beam on the building side of the ladder is above and over the objective extend the ladder so that the beam on the building side of, uh, is side of the ladder is above and over the objective. We already talked about this. You lower, the, you lower the aerial to the victim. You don't extend up or raise up to them because they may, could jump more. Uh, this is older thing. Um, older apparatus, you, always, you had to lock. Once you get your ladder in position, you locked it. Um, you no longer had to do that. These things automatically lock. Um, the newer apparatus do. But just remember, this could be a test question. Um, talks about here, placement of aerial device. Uh, when using an aerial ladder, the first rung of the ladder tip should be placed even with the window seal. Is that always possible? Probably not, because you may have the size of the window, you may not be able to do that. So you're not gonna always be able to do that. That's just a recommendation. Talks about platforms. This is probably one of the easier ways to remove a victim is you know you get if you got a platform this is where it comes in handy you can put the rails even with the window sill and lower the person feet first into the basket why do we extend our ladders just like ground ladders why do we extend our aerial devices six feet above a roof line visibility that's one uh, easier to get on and off um, gives them a handhold especially if you're rescuing Civilians or something like that, they're not used to climbing ladders, so it gives them a handhold to hold on to the ladder. Um, also, there's always lights on these ladders. Also, have them lights turned on, even if it's daytime sometimes. If you've got bad smoke conditions or the smoke conditions change, at least that gives them a guide to where the ladder's at. Talks about using uh, platforms um, to access a flat roof. Um, Raising it up, you know, above, 
and pass the roof line. Uh, one thing that you can use for aerial devices, especially a platform, and I've heard it done before, is like on a roof. If you got a ventilated roof, you can raise it up to the roof. You can, they can use the controls in the basket, level the, the device, and then they can also, uh, they can cut their hole without ever leaving the basket, level it back up, and retract it. They can do all that without ever getting on the roof. So it does, uh, working off an aerial device or a platform, you can, you can do your holes, cut your holes and all that with ever, ever getting on a roof. Okay, does this look safe with these parapet walls? Would you do this? I probably, I would do what? What would you do? Put it where? What's another way to avoid ladder in one of these walls if you come upon a building like this. Take the side or the rear because most of these are going to be on the front. They're lightweight construction um, and like I said they're not going to be very sturdy. Uh, this would be your last, your last option. But you should be able because they're only going to be on the front most of the time so you should be able to access the roof from the rear or the sides. I try to avoid doing this. All right, talks about aerial device properly positioned rescuers may remove victims from the structure. Talks about the type of aerial device you're going to use and the age and condition. Is it going to be a platform that you're using or are you going to be using an aerial ladder? Um, most of the time, it's going to take two people inside the structure to get somebody out of it, um, to lift them up, get them onto the aerial device. Um, we all know how much rescue Randy, one of those ways, how much. Yeah, sometimes 150, 175, between that, 75 pounds. And you know how heavy that is. That's dead weight. So you're going to need usually two people inside the structure to get that person onto an aerial device. Um, like I said, you got to watch over, avoid, avoid overloading the tip of it. If you look at this right here, you got two fully uh, full PPE firefighters on the end of this ladder with a victim. Say they're using a dummy. But that's quite a bit of weight right there. Um, we talked about earlier three points of contact with the uh, infant and stuff like that, carrying an infant down. You know how hard it is climbing a ladder carrying a tool or down a tool, um, tool down the ladder. Can you imagine carrying a small child down? Um, and that's, that's something you got to be wary of when you're climbing or, or descending a ladder. Um, you may probably want your ladder belt on just in case you had to hook in or something for some reason. Uh, this is probably one of the better methods, this knee sit method, where you can just slide the person down the aerial device, depending on the size of them. This might be the best option. This to me is a little risky um, because you're using the, basically the beams to control the descent of this person. You probably got 20 people below filming with uh, with uh, their phones and stuff. So if you lose your balance or something like that, or the person, they're gonna go over the edge of that ladder. Same with this one here. It's, this is very risky carrying it down over the shoulder, um, trying to get somebody down. Uh, they talk about here, aerial platforms not suited for mass evacuations from a single point. Problem with that is like tire two, it's rated, I think, a thousand pound capacity, the basket is. So by the time you got, say, one firefighter or two firefighters in there, and you got two or three victims, you're gonna probably exceed the, the weight of the basket real quick. Uh, two firefighters are required to move an unconscious victim. We kind of talked about that. Uh, victims jumping onto the aerial device, we talked about that too. Um, they said Stokes basket using an aerial ladder should be used as a last result. Using lowering a Stokes basket using an aerial ladder should be the you're used as your last result. Um, does any of these Stokes baskets fit inside the beams of an aerial device? Have y'all tried to put one in there? They're probably not. They're going to sit up on top of those rails right here as you lower it down. Um, y'all probably don't remember some of y'all. I don't think any of y'all probably do. A few years back, uh, Second Street fire. They had a lady that was, I think on the second floor, she was deceased. She weighed over a, in excess of 350 pounds. 
So they had to find a way to get her out of the building. So what they did, they put her in a Stokes basket, set her up on the rail, but the problem was the Stokes basket kept falling down in between the rails and stuff. Well, they got her down just enough where they could lower the device and lift her out. So you had to come up with an option, different options you got to use to get somebody out of a, out of a structure. Like I said, you're not, it's not always possible to remove somebody out of a building using an aerial device, depending on the size of them and how many people you have to help. Talks about aerial devices may be equipped with lifting eye that may be used for rescue operations. Some of this kind of Stokes basket stuff they talk about. But also, should aerial devices ever be used as cranes? No, don't do that. Um, the tire can be. The tire is equipped with two uh, hooks, eyelets on its basket. Each one's rated for 500 pounds. It's also the boom has got an eyelet on there that's rated for a thousand pounds so or five thousand pounds so that can be used as a crane if you need to that can be used they said they've used it in the past to stabilize a car or something like that so that's the only thing we got in our fleet that could be used as a crane according to the manufacturer's uh, recommendation uh talked about talking about water rescues with aerial devices uh, a couple years ago they had to use uh, quint 10 to rescue a guy off uh, that was hanging to a tree in uh, one of the swollen creeks over in Cherokee Park. A um, little background on it, the guy was, uh, it was nighttime, driving through the park, creek was swollen, didn't see it, drove into the creek. His car, he was outside, when engine 20 pulled up, he was outside his vehicle sitting on the car. It was pinned up pretty good to a tree, it wasn't going anywhere. For some reason, the guy got off the vehicle, fell off the vehicle, was pulled down the stream, able to grab a tree right before he went into a culvert that would have probably sucked him in, probably would have killed him. He's able to hang on to that. Um, Quintin showed up, Rescue 2 showed up. Quintin was able to position next to the creek, extend their ladder out over the side, and they went out, put a PFD on them, pulled the person in. What's a couple things they had to worry about? when they were positioning and stuff there. What's that? Well, the angle? Well, yeah, but you got the ground. First, you got to worry about stabilizing your the apparatus. Is your ground solid enough to stabilize it? You got to worry about the creek. It's still raining. The creek's still rising, so are you too close? And they were talking about some of the jack plates. When they were trying to put the jack plates down, the water was, was pushing the jack plates away. So they were pretty close to it. So as soon as they got the person off of there, they had to, they had to move quickly to get that apparatus out of there before that was, was sucked into the water or pulled into the water. So things you gotta be aware of when you're working. When you're working around water, what do you wanna have on? PFDs. You wanna have your fire gear on? No, avoid having your fire gear on, have your PFDs on when you're working around it. So y'all, truck one, Guys, girls, y'all have uh, you have your wet dry suits. What do y'all wear? <laughs> yeah, flip water, whatever. You have that on. Um, all right. I think we're talking about just the PFD things to think about. Um, okay, talks about. I was going to show a video, but it takes a while. The video is not that long, and it takes a while to pull it up. Uh, the video is the two firefighters from Massachusetts. Uh, they were doing roof operations, uh, doing ventilation. It, it kind of, the video picked up where they'd already cut the hole. They're on the end of an aerial device. They're using the pike poles to uh, clear it out. And they were done, and I don't understand why they were still up there. Should have been like going ahead and climbing down the aerial device, retracting the aerial device, getting it away from there. Still over it, a bunch of fire shot out of the opening. Uh, luckily, they were back enough where it didn't get them, but it did get some fire impingement on the ladder. So, you know, the thing about it, once you're on a roof, get off the roof. After you're done doing what you need to do or you're on the aerial device, after you cut the hole, you cleared it out, get down the aerial device. Don't stay up there, there's no reason to. We talked about aerial device can, be, can also assist in ventilating the fire building. We talked about this, I think, a little bit <laughs> earlier, doing horizontal cross ventilation can be accomplished with aerial device. What's the things you're looking at here? 
as far as if you're taking out a window from an aerial device, what do you want to do? Be upwind. What's another thing? Check below before you take the window out. Make sure nobody's down there. What else? Above the window um, when you're taking it out. Make sure you clear the window all out if possible. We don't leave any shards of glass. All right. All right. A couple things you look at when we use elevated master streams. We protect exposures with them directly attack the fire, and we cool embers, gases within the thermal column. Three things we do when we have elevated master streams. Uh, positioning apparatus, we talked about that corner, decreases the chance of damage to the truck, injury to the firefighters, damage from heat. Some we already covered. Uh, what do you think they mean by blitz attack with an aerial device? Yeah, basically what you're doing, you're resetting the fire. You're, uh, you got a lot of heavy fire inside a structure. You're using, sometimes you use deck guns. Most of the time that's what you use is a deck gun. But using an aerial stream or a squirt or something like that to knock most of the fire down, open it up for a minute or so or less, and then after you get it knocked down, much of it knocked down, you go ahead and shut it down and let them go in with hand lines and knock the rest down, clean it up. And it shows one kind of right there. Um, talks about solid stream nozzles and fog nozzles. We carry fog nozzles on all our apparatus. But sometimes you need those solid stream tips. Uh, during the Sane Street fire, we had a lot of fire in that uh, building. Um, the fog nozzles, we had, we had a lot of wind that night too. A pretty, a pretty good amount of wind that was coming through there. Um, and it was breaking up those streams. Even when you take the fog nozzle and put it on a straight stream, it's still not, it was evaporating as soon as it's hitting it. So they switched out, a couple of the apparatus switched to solid stream nozzles so they could penetrate the fire better. Now, the problem was that was a gas-fed fire. We weren't doing anything until they found a way to shut the gas off. Um, once they did that, then like I said, they, they went to more using a solid stream nozzles. They changed out those nozzles from the fog to a solid stream and it gave a better reach and uh, better penetration. So there's different instances you may need to use to change out the tips. Just remember when you are doing something like that, um, before is like we're talking about the blitz attack or anything, um, what should you think before you open that nozzle? What's that? That's one thing. Make sure before you open a master stream, make sure it's on a fog because you don't know which, you don't know where it's positioned. So I've seen where people have opened streams and it hadn't hit the building at all and it's hidden the back of the building. Of course, you got a group of people standing in the back. You're taking a chance of hitting them with a, with a, a master stream. So open it up on a fog pattern and then, then you can put it to a more of a straight stream once you got a better understanding of where that stream's going. Another thing before you open it, doing some type of blitz attack, what do you want to make sure of? Everybody's out of the building. Make sure, I've seen it happen where people have been inside the building and they open a deck gun or something like that. Just with a hand line, the, the amount of problems it causes. I've been hit with a hand line before. I'd hate to be hit with a straight stream or a, a master stream. So, so just remember, make sure before you're given that order, make sure again that everybody's out of the building before you do it. Uh, just talks about here, we're gonna kind of skim over this uh, using foam with aerial devices. Um, these are the type of incidents that you could use it on. Uh, seen it, hadn't seen it on this, um, but I have seen fires in the bulk fuel storage tanks, uh, aircraft, industrial facilities, transportation incidents. If we had to have a large amount of foam which we do have a storage, I think, at 21s to supply the nozzle down there at engine 19. But it's going to take a while to get all that stuff coordinated and get it to the scene. Um, what's another probably, and I've seen it used before, been called to scenes on uh, like tankers that have uh, turned over, gas tankers that have turned over. What's another place that's got large quantity of foam? What's that? Yeah. You can, uh, just depending on if they'll do it, you can request an airport piece of apparatus from the airport to uh, for to a scene to provide uh, foam. 
Uh, again, it talks about the blitz attack. Just make sure everybody's out of the building before you open it up. Talks about that. Talks about another way of directing your stream, uh, putting it off the roof of uh, of a floor and knocking it uh, to hit the seat of the fire. Uh, it talks about most common use of elevated mass streams is in defensive operations. That's the main use we use them for. All right, stand pipes, portable stand pipes. When would you use a portable stand pipe? Parking garage is the only time I've ever seen it used. Now, they did tell me that the Kentucky Center for the Arts, there was one used there. I think uh, Truck One used it. I think Public Slow Down a couple of months ago used it up on the interstate. Did they? Overpass? Uh, yeah, yeah. Possible. You yeah. might need that if you got a. Big. Yeah. Was that what it was? Well, most of your, most of your hydrants are going to be below, so, so that's where you're going to go with that. So. Um, yeah, it's a couple different things. Like we're just talking about parking garages, fires on building roofs. Uh, that's Kentucky Center for the Arts. Fire on uh, bridges, overpasses. Y'all just talked about buildings under construction that don't have standpipe systems, not available. So that's the things you could use. The mainly only thing I've ever seen is used on a parking garage. Um, because parking garages, they got standpipe systems in them, but when they're built, they don't have to inspect those yearly. They're dry systems, so if you do hook into one of them, be ready for them to fail, because most times they probably will. Because um, like I said, they hadn't been maintained, they hadn't been inspected. Uh, exposure protection, we kind of already went over this. Most of the time we're dealing with radiant heat, but you also got conduction, convection. Uh, things that contribute to exposure hazards, weather, wind, uh, building construction, you know, what it's, uh, what it's made of. If it's fire resistant, you're probably not going to have as much of a problem with exposure other than, than you may with an ordinary or wood frame. Intensity of fire spacing between the fire building. Uh, both conditions, like I said, we talked about wind. Can, uh, can uh, enhance the effects of an exposure of fire. Uh, rain, don't ever believe that... Uh, Reduces the potential for fire spread. I always heard, ah, it's raining out tonight. We're not, you're not going to make any fires. I made a couple, probably the best fires I've ever made is when it was pretty good rain going down with an exposure. So that's not always the case. Uh, again, we talked about exposure at the scene, placement of the apparatus. We talked about that. And this is one thing you can do. If you do get too close, you can use an engine to uh, cool off the apparatus prevent damage from happening. This was kind of what they had to do at Zane Street. You had so much, you had some issues with wind, but you had so much embers that night. Um, I'm surprised Rumpke was right sitting right behind that warehouse. I'm surprised Rumpke and some surrounding buildings didn't catch fire that night. Um, because like I said, there were so many embers flying in the air that night. Um, just for that, just to contain it to the warehouse, uh, is pretty amazing. Because I figure with something more than that would have would caught fire and burned down that night. Uh, it talks about here using one stream. Here you can actually attack both the fire and the and protect the exposure. It's with an aerial device. With tire two, it's got the two nozzles on it. You can a direct fire attack and exposure. But if you're going to flow both those nozzles, what do you think you need? Well, you're going to need another what? You got one engine supply on one side, you're going to need another engine, right? So you're probably going to have to call for an extra engine or something to supply the other side. Um, that's when you come into water supply issues if you got hydrants available. <coughs> Enough water. Types of streams to use when depending on the condition. Like I said, y'all can look at this, go back over these slides again, you can look through your book. Uh, talks about here air rescue, aircraft rescue, and firefighting incidents. Um, if we do respond to something at the airport, we're kind of, I want to say, like the third option. Your primary is going to be what? Airport. Probably the secondary is going to be air guard. Um, because they got what? Large quantities of foam if dealing with jet fuel, fire and stuff. So they're going to be, now if you do have an incident, 
where it does happen, where they have an emergency landing, maybe a fire in the cab or something, we may make entry for rescues or something like that. Um, if it happens off the property, if there is a crash, God forbid that something like that does happen off the property, then we're going to be first on the scene. But the airport, probably air guard's going to be we're coming to because the, we're going to need that large quantity of fuel. Um, Quintin houses an apparatus with uh, some dry, dry powder and some foam. Um, but out there, you're dealing with light aircraft. You're not dealing with the big 747s, GPS planes, all that stuff coming in. So, um, but with that, mainly we're going to be stand by whatever they need us to do. Um, just kind of goes over a few things. You got to have safety conditions you got to worry about when you're working around aircraft. Like I said, you can read over that stuff. Um, I'm not going to jump into that too much. All right, talks about thermal imaging cameras and piercing nozzles. We don't have any of that. That's you're going to find with the aircraft rescue. You're going to find that on the airport and the air guard. They're going to have stuff like that. Um, they're okay. That's going to be. They're going to have those capabilities. All right. Any questions? I know we went through this pretty quick. Like I said, we kind of skimmed over some of this stuff, but everything's fair game on this test. Whatever's in that book, whatever's in the mess LPs. KRS uh, laws and stuff, um, it's all fair game for the test. Um, for the ones that are able to take it, or eligible to take it, good luck this year.